This lecture is going to focus on the 1970s. Um, we're going to look at the 70s as a decade of crisis, of economic crisis, of political crisis, of international crisis, and ultimately of domestic crisis as well. There's always a danger when you use decades as a means of explaining historical events, because decades ultimately are artificial constructs. Um, there's no reason why we should use 10 years as a unit of measurement, but we do. Um, so when we use decades and we sort of try to distinguish important trends that are happening during decades, we have to realize that these are artificial, and that sometimes by doing so we tend to overemphasize some historical trends and perhaps under underemphasize others that may continue across decades. So I just want to sort of make that, that caveat, that kind of explanation before we discuss this decade, because some of these changes certainly um, happen before the decade, and I'll do my best to explain so in the course of this lecture, and they certainly carry on into the subsequent decades. But the 1970s is certainly a decade that we see a lot of these major, major crises striking the United States. And it's a decade in which these crises are made even worse because of the very high post-World War II expectations that many Americans had. The decades from World, the end of World War II up until the beginning of the 1970s were arguably incredibly prosperous decades for the United States and for Americans. Many Americans, for the first time in their lives, entered the middle class. They received college educations or they obtained very good, strong, well-paying union jobs that didn't require college educations. And in either case, they made a fairly reasonable amount of money and were able to sort of live the middle class lifestyle that they had aspired to and certainly many of the in cases their parents had aspired to. So for people living, growing up or coming of age between the end of World War II, 1945, and the beginning of the 1970s, this was a great time period. These were a golden, golden period in um, American history, despite all the sort of social unrest of the 1960s, and despite the war in Vietnam, and all these other problems that happened in the 60s. Arguably, this was a very, very good time period for many Americans. And abruptly, in the very early part of the 1970s, this period of prosperity, of economic prosperity, of, of relative social prosperity, comes to a halt and comes crashing down and it just creates a real sense of crisis in the United States. Between 1945 and 1970, the United States, again, is in a very prosperous position. The U.S. is a primarily an exporting nation. The U.S. is exporting a considerable amount of the material that people in throughout the rest of the world are using. So the U.S. is a net exporter. We're exporting more than we're bringing in. And as a result of that, we're making a lot of money. A lot of money is flowing into the United States. And the balance of trade is in the U.S. favor. In other words, the U.S. is exporting more than it's importing. It's taking in more money than it's, than it's paying out to other nations. The military industrial academic complex, this sort of this term, the shorthand term for the relationship between the U.S. government, corporations, and academia that had developed during the Cold War had been very successful in putting a lot of people to work. A lot of college graduates got jobs in industry or got jobs working for the government. A lot of businesses uh, were very successful because they were largely being funded by the government for military purposes or for national defense purposes. And as a result, for most Americans, job security was a, a really an all-time high. Wages were outpacing inflation, which meant that people had more money to spend. And in many respects, life was very good. There was this common sense of prosperity, and it was consumer prosperity. People spent money on stuff, and they were able to accumulate things because they had that money to spend, and they could save and spend at the same time, and, and they had enough money to do so. Well, beginning in the early 70s, that, that period of economic prosperity comes crashing down for a number of reasons that we'll, that we'll explain here in just a minute. One of the reasons for this is that domestic spending in the United States really got out of control during the 1960s because Presidents Kennedy and then Johnson and Nixon ultimately were trying to spend money on too many different things. And the biggest problem was that a lot of money was going out for the Vietnam War, you know, talking about millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, but an equally large amount of money was going out to support the so-called Great Society projects that Lyndon Johnson had initiated, Medicare and Medicaid. 
educational programs, anti-poverty initiatives. So the U.S. government was just spending far more money than it was taking in, in a sense. And it was, it was starting to run deficits and debt, and the debt was starting to grow. And as a result of that, this creates a, an economic situation in the United States that's rather difficult because uh, the government was, was having a problem sort of meeting some of its um, obligations, its financial obligations. There's a trade balance that begins during this same time period. Here we have a graph that shows this. In the 1970s, balance of trade was roughly even. In other words, America was exporting, in terms of financial terms, was exporting as much as it was importing. It was basically breaking even. It was paying out other countries for products as much as other countries were paying the U.S. in net terms for products. But during the 1970s, this trade imbalance begins to start um, moving away from um, in Americans' favor, especially as um, we begin to see the first instances of trade deficits starting in 1971, where in fact the U.S. for the first time in the post-World War II era is actually spending, sending out more money than it's taking in, in for products on a nationwide scale. And the reason for that is there's multiple multiple factors. One was that in auto, the automotive industry in Japan and Germany was becoming very successful during this decade. German manufacturers were manufacturing cars that Americans wanted to buy. Japanese manufacturers had started developing small, inexpensive cars that appealed to Americans who didn't have as much money. And over the course of this decade, more and more Americans are willing to start buying cars made internationally as opposed to being American-made. By the end of the decade, about 35% of U.S. cars are being imported. And this is just a remarkable figure since most Americans had bought American-made cars prior to the 1970s. So this trade balance begins to grow and grow over the course of the 70s. There are a few years where it's a positive again, but then especially beginning around 1975, 76, it starts getting more and more negative, and finally by the early 80s, it just completely drops off a cliff in many respects. Um, one of the reasons for this is, of course, as I mentioned, this economic imbalance is more and more people are buying foreign-made products, and more and more U.S. companies were beginning to outsource production to uh, overseas, which meant that while the companies themselves were making money, um, a lot of that money was ultimately going overseas. And what happens is it starts to create trade imbalance problems, imbalance of payment issues. And in financial terms, what it means is that U.S. dollars are fleeing the United States to foreign countries. And at this point, the United States was still on the gold standard, which meant that U.S. dollars, paper bills, could be exchanged literally for gold um, at a one-to-one -one relationship, that foreign countries could take U.S. currency and say, we want gold in place of, of greenbacks, in place of dollar bills. Well, as more and more foreign U.S. currency leaves as people spend money on products made overseas and foreign governments want to cash in those greenbacks for gold, this starts to deplete the U.S. gold reserves. And there's a sense of political crisis that the U.S. gold reserves are being depleted and at a very quick, rapid pace. Uh, and the U.S. begins to worry about what's going to happen. Ultimately, in 1971... President Nixon and his advisors make the decision to take the U.S. off the gold standard. No longer will dollar currency, will U.S. dollar in a currency be directly exchangeable for gold. Um, and he does this because of this fear that um, U.S. gold reserves are being depleted because U.S. currency is going overseas. Also, he takes the U.S. off the Bretton Woods Agreement. We talked about Bretton Woods in an earlier lecture. But Bretton Woods was this agreement that happens at the end of World War II that says the dollar will be the official kind of benchmark currency against which all of their countries will adjust their currencies. So as the U.S. dollar adjusts, all the other currencies will automatically adjust in relationship to that. What that tended to mean was that the U.S. dollar was overvalued and other currencies oftentimes were undervalued. In, in basic economic terms, that meant that um, buying products overseas was cheaper because the U.S. dollar was overvalued, foreign currencies were undervalued, and it meant you could get a lot more for your dollar. But it also meant that more dollars were going overseas as a result of that. So taking the U.S. off Bretton Woods meant that the dollar would free float against other currencies, and the U.S. government could use various economic policies to increase or decrease the value of the dollar relative to other currencies, and other countries could do the exact same with their currencies. Well, what this does is, again, it ends the U.S. dollar as a fixed standard against other international currencies and leads to a major, major shift in the value of the dollar. A lot of other countries start 
kind of panicking because they see the U.S. is changing the rules of the game, and they go off the U- U.K. goes off the British uh, pound sterling as their standard, and their currency starts to free float against the dollar. Other countries in Europe take the same measure, and so all of a sudden, it's sort of all the rules have changed, and no longer is there a gold standard, no longer is the U.S. dollar the currency against which all their currencies are measured, and this causes a major weakness as a result in the dollar. The dollar becomes very weak against other foreign currencies. Well, as this this weakening of the dollar is happening um, internationally, another crisis happens, and this is the oil crisis that begins in 1973. In 1973, OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, which was primarily um, Middle Eastern nations and a few um, other countries um, outside the Middle East, makes a decision to impose an oil embargo against the United States and a number of other European nations in response for support of Israel during the 1973 uh, Yom Kippur War against its Middle Eastern neighbors. And in this case, it's seen as sort of a way of punishing the United States for supporting Israel. Israel um, had been attacked, and the U.S. had helped essentially bail out the Israelis through massive uh, both financial and military um, support during the war. Well, this causes a major oil crisis because um, with the essentially supply of oil cut off from the Middle East, there's not enough oil in the United States for gasoline or for electrical generation purposes. And this price goes up considerably because essentially demand is inelastic. In other words, people can't just stop using oil right away. So because of that, the price goes up. And the price increases four times in less than a year and causes a massive amount of inflation because oil prices going up leads to food prices going up because it uses you use gasoline to transport food and you use gasoline to power farm equipment. And so pretty soon everything is going up. Food prices are going up. Oil prices are going up. Everything is, is going up. And this starts to create a major disaster for U.S. industries because they can't afford to manufacture and they can't afford to sell uh, at the old prices. They have to raise prices. And American consumers suddenly can't afford to buy things because their wages aren't going up to meet the uh, inflation. Of course, this oil crisis for Americans means no gasoline. Suddenly gasoline is, is unavailable. And as a result of that, rationing, in a sense, begins to take place. The U.S. government imposes these special rules about when everybody's allowed to get gasoline when only commercial gasoline can be sold or when there's no gasoline available and essentially a form of rationing goes into effect during the the worst months of the crisis immediately after the 1973 embargo begins and of course this creates a real sense of um, urgency in the United States as Americans who are used to being able to get gasoline whenever they wanted to and as much as they wanted to suddenly find themselves unable to travel because they can't get gasoline truckers become concerned because it makes it harder for them to make a living for independent truckers and this creates a real political crisis uh, in the United States. The other aspect of this is that it leads to something called stagflation. Stagflation being a word that's created out of the word stagnation and the words inflation. And what happens during this period is that we see both of these processes. Inflation because of increasing oil prices, because of um, the weakening of the US dollar against other currencies after the end of the gold standard in Bretton Woods, and stagnation in the economy. Businesses stop hiring, they stop raising wages because they can't afford to. Um, Industries start relocating overseas to save money. And this creates a period during the 70s and into the early 1980s of just stagnant economic activity in the United States. People suddenly have been used to their wages going up every year or two. People have been used to having more money to spend and suddenly all that is reversed. And this huge gain that's made after World War II is halted in its tracks. Well, the long-term consequences of this economic crisis are, are, there are a number of them. What first is corporations continue to outsource. They continue to look overseas for cheaper labor and cheaper um, places to manufacture. And so more and more jobs are being are leaving the United States, especially manufacturing jobs, leaving the United States for overseas. And this has an impact on the U.S. economy. We also see a decline in public services as a result of this. Because 
as more and more good jobs are going over the seas, people are having to take lower paying jobs or they're just losing their jobs. They can't afford, they're not paying as much in taxes. They're not being able to pay as much for nice homes. So local cities, states, and ultimately the federal government begin to take in fewer and fewer tax dollars. And this leads to having to slash budgets. And so suddenly they can't spend as much money on police services or as much money on fire services. And this really leads to a decline in the quality of life for people who are, who are living in these locations. It also leads to a gap between rich and poor. The rich are able to hang on to more of their money um, through various means than the poor. And the poor who are dependent on the work that's going overseas or the companies that are shutting down, um, they can't find replacement jobs as easily. And so the, we begin to see a greater gap. The gap between rich and poor had been shrinking since the 30s, and suddenly that reverses. And of course, the poor are most affected by stagflation because they're the ones who have the poorest jobs. They can't afford to save money and put it away in banks, which were paying very high interest rates at this point. Um, and instead, they're having to try to survive as best they can on what they could get. We also see during the same time period a decline in good, well-paying union jobs in the north, places like Detroit and Buffalo, and companies relocating, if they were choosing to stay in the United States, relocating to non-union places in the south or in the west where they could pay lower wages uh, for the same level of work. And ultimately, the cultural outcome of this is that we see lowered expectations. In other words, people begin to start realizing that perhaps their lives or their children's lives are going to be worse than their parents' lives. Here, everybody was thinking, you know, my kids are going to live better than me. Suddenly, people start questioning whether that's the case. This, this quote-unquote American dream of the next generation being better than the previous, people start to question that. And it also, of course, leads to this creation of, in some ways, a permanent economic underclass in the United States. People who just simply have no ability and no expectation of rising up from poverty and living better lives. Now, people who essentially sort of, you know, essentially resign themselves to being poor um, their whole lives. So this economic crisis of the 70s uh, has a very strong um, kind of social impact and cultural impact on the United States during the 70s and the decades that follow. Now, in addition to this economic crisis of the 70s, we also have a political crisis. And it's a political crisis that, just like the economic crisis, has a strong impact on Americans' belief in government, Americans' belief in their political leaders. Um, because before the 70s, politics had been largely considered to be an honorable profession. Of course, there were corrupt politicians. Everybody knew that. But media tended not to report on that quite as much. There tended not to be perhaps as, as high a level of corruption, um, or the corruption tended to be... Um, financial corruption, in a sense, and not sort of a moral corruption um, or, you know, deliberate misrepresentations, things like that. But during and after the 70s, there's a growing disenchantment with politics and with the American government, in a sense that instead of the government being there to do good things for the American population, that the government was a problem. The government lied. American political leaders did their best to deceive the American public and not tell them what was really going on. A lot of this, of course, came about as a result of Vietnam, of the Vietnam War of the 1960s that doesn't eventually end until 1973 when U.S. troops are finally uh, withdrawn in, in, in total. Um, but the Vietnam War after the war itself, lots of leaks happen and lots of documents become public and it becomes very clear that the U.S. government had been misleading the public throughout the course of the war about how likely it, the U.S. was to win the conflict. It becomes obvious here we have a map that was, that was issued by the CIA um, that CIA, is the Central Intelligence Agency, was conducting secret wars in places like Cambodia and Laos along the border of Vietnam, that there were these covert wars happening in countries that we were not you know, in any way technically at war with, but that were still killing people, both Americans and, um, and people from those nations, um, and that were costing lots of money. And ultimately, as the scope of the conflict is revealed, the fact that nearly two million civilians are killed in Vietnam during this conflict, um, that, again, thousands of Americans are killed during this conflict, it, it, people become much more skeptical of the, US, the, ro the motives and sort of the honesty of American political leaders. It also becomes um, revealed as the war is ending that both the FBI and the CIA were using various means to discredit domestic protesters uh, for um, basically political orders. The CIA, which was not even allowed legally to operate in the United States, was, was working with the FBI to um, do essentially raid operations that were being run by these, these peace groups or by groups like STS, 
our SDS, Students for Democratic Society. Um, and so in a sense, it becomes very obvious that the government was essentially really abusing its power and misusing its power. So people begin to go very skeptical of the, on of the overall honesty of the government. The one event that really contributes, of course, to this, this sense of really doubting the integrity and honesty of politicians is the Watergate affair. And Watergate stems from Richard Nixon, president elected in 1968 and who runs for re-election in 1972, his extreme distrust uh, in his opponents and his extreme desire to get as much evidence as possible to utterly destroy his political opponents. And in 1972, R Richard Nixon's running for re-election and some of his, and he and his supporters are looking for ways to sort of dig up dirt on opposition, on ways to sort of maintain an eye on what his opponents in the Democratic Party were doing. And so Nixon's staff, Nixon may not have had direct knowledge of, of the event itself, but some of Nixon's staff hire a, a bunch of, of some cases, former CIA and some uh, former FBI people to bug the Democratic National Committee offices in the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C., the DNC being sort of the organization that is running the Democratic campaign for uh, president in 1972 and other congressional campaigns. Nixon wanted to bug the or Nixon's staff decided that bugging the offices might get them good information about what their opponents were doing. Well, eventually these these people who are hired to bug the office, the plumbers as they're called, they get caught through a variety of, of bungling activity actions on their part. And what begins next is a huge cover-up. Initially, again, by Nixon's staff, and then Nixon, uh, if he wasn't initially aware of it, quickly becomes aware of it and starts lying to the public about it. And his staff, of course, are lying to the public about the White House not having any knowledge of this, trying to pay off these plumbers not to talk uh, to the courts or not to talk to the media. And ultimately, this, this cover-up continues and gets bigger and bigger. More people get involved. And as the media begins to investigate, um, it starts to become clear that this cover-up goes really to the highest levels of government. And ultimately, what it leads to is a huge congressional investigation of the Watergate affair. Here, pictured some of part of this investigation. And essentially what it leads to is that the U.S. House of Representatives recommending impeachment of the president for actions that are not unbe that are essentially unbecoming of his political office and probably illegal rather than going through an impeachment nixon chooses to resign the presidency and ultimately he leaves office in 1973 uh, essentially leaves in exile to his home in california well in nixon's place is vice president gerald ford takes office, and Ford fairly quickly decides that the best course of action is to pardon Nixon, to spare the country a trial that might, you know, lead to more, um, more kind of, uh, of distrust in the U.S. government. And, of course, for Ford, by pardoning Nixon, he sort of seals his own fate in a way because he's seen as complicit in some ways in, in this whole activity. But ultimately, this, this Watergate event and Nixon's resignation and for its pardoning of Nixon, again, just lead many Americans to grow completely skeptical of the government, to distrust it, to distrust the motives of political leaders, and to feel, in a sense, that the government was a giant scam or a giant, giant, just, just huge mistake um, that was in, during this time period. Well, of course, after Nixon, Ford takes office, and Ford, and then later Jimmy Carter, who becomes president in 1976, um, neither of them are terribly effectual presidents. They, they have a lot of problems that they're dealing with. Ford and Carter are both dealing with stagflation. They're both dealing with these um, energy crises due, um, due to the OPEC's embargo. And ultimately, um, because of this, they have so many problems that they're dealing with that they very, have a very hard time really establishing strong initiatives during their administration. So in a sense, Nixon resigns in disgrace. Ford has a difficult presidency. Um, he doesn't win re-election. Carter's elected. He's still struggling with stagflation and crises. And in a way, America it doesn't really reverse this opinion that many Americans had that their political leaders were not particularly competent or their polit the political leaders were not particularly uh, effectual at their jobs. And so this political apathy that I'm part of many Americans continues and sort of spreads throughout the population. And so people just develop this very cynical, skeptical attitude about politics and start to lose interest in being involved in politics during this time period. Now, the third of these sort of major crises 
that happens during this time period is in foreign policy. And while it's both a period of crisis, but it's also a period of opportunity, and so I have to emphasize that. The crisis itself largely comes about, again, as a result of the Vietnam War. And it's oftentimes termed the Vietnam Syndrome. The sort of the shorthand phrase, or the Vietnam Effect, sometimes it's also called. And what happens is that American, the American public and American political leaders go very wary of American military forces being involved in overseas activities. Um, and so for really a decade or after the end of the Vietnam War, American military is very hesitant to, to do anything that might lead to putting American lives at risk. American political leaders, um, Ford and then Carter, are very hesitant to um, use the military is a foreign policy option to send American troops overseas to places where they might get hurt or killed, not to take military risks. And this very strong sense that America couldn't afford to take military risks anymore. Um, and as partly a result of this sort of this Vietnam effect or Vietnam syndrome, um, we see a decline in American hegemony. I mean, in other words, hegemony or hegemony, depending on how you pronounce it, is the the use of force to to sort of exert power and america had used its economic and military and political power to have hegemony in places like the middle east where american influences were very strong Mid latin and south america where american influences are very strong but as the america begins to increasingly hesitate to use military force or military influence to kind of get its way as it loses a lot of money as a result of the economic crisis of the 70s. Increasingly, America can't afford to exert power or hegemony um, throughout the world. And as a result of this, we see areas like the Middle East become increasingly more um, perhaps hostile to the United States or at least more complicated for the United States. And areas in Latin and South America the same way. American uh, influences decline in South America and Latin America, places that start to become falling under communist influence or socialist influence, which many Americans, especially political leaders, are very concerned about. We see a growing threat from political terrorism throughout the world, in both in Europe and in the Middle East, and also ultimately the rise of religious fundamentalism in the Middle East, um, the growth of a radical kind of Islamic movement um, that begins in the Middle East and eventually spreads and, and ultimately um, has broader impacts on the world in the 1980s and 1990s. So this whole sort of this this sort of trickle down effect of the Vietnam War and, and the outcome of the Vietnam War really affects American um, confidence, foreign policy confidence during the 70s uh, in very profound ways. On the other hand, um, the 70s is really a decade where the Cold War is in some ways re-evaluated or kind of reinterpreted. And much of that has to do with uh, Presidents Nixon and then Gerald Ford's dealings with other communist nations. Nixon shocks the world, certainly shocks Americans, when in 1972 he goes to China and meets with Mao, the, the great the Chinese communist leader who had really helped bring about this communist revolution in China in the 1940s. And Nixon had been a hardcore anti-communist uh, throughout his entire political career and was really seen as being one of these true, true anti-communist uh, political leaders in the United States. And so it shocks many people that he would be willing to go to China and meet with one of the, the truly powerful communist leaders of the world. But ultimately, what it becomes clear is that Nixon's strategy is part of a uh, sort of a reevaluation of the Cold War, because Nixon and his advisors recognized that China and, and the USSR were not part of one giant, powerful, monolithic communist movement. That China and the USSR actually had a lot of um, hatred and aggression towards each other. That they had actually fought a number of border skirmishes in places in Manchuria. And so Nixon and his advisors started to think that perhaps if the U.S. could befriend China or could establish diplomatic relationships with China, and China had been excluded diplomatically uh, from the United Nations and a lot of other international organizations basically because of the U.S. Uh, influence in those organizations. But if the U.S. and China could establish a working relationship and China could gain influence in the international community, this might actually be a way of going after the USSR. And so Nixon goes to China in 1972, establishes diplomatic relations with China. China gets a seat uh, in the United Nations on Security Council, which is very important for them. 
Um, and it also opens economic opportunities in China for American businesses. And pretty soon China starts to export products to the United States. And of course, this continues up until the present era. So for Nixon to go to China and really embrace this sort of this communist nation is a dramatic event during the 70s and really kind of helps shape and really shift the focus of the Cold War in some ways um, and showing that not all communist nations were necessarily inherently um, dangerous or inherently threatening to the United States. Another shift in the Cold War during this time period is an emphasis on a new policy called detente, which was a policy of kind of a, of a peaceful relationship, or at least a, establishing a sort of a peaceful middle ground between the United States and the Soviet Union, an effort to sort of ratchet down the tensions of the 1960s, especially the nuclear tensions of, of the 1960s. And so in 1975, Gerald Ford and um, Brezhnev, who's the head of the Soviet Union at the time, signed a number of accords. They signed a number of uh, military accords for nuclear weapons. They also signed the Helsinki Accords in Helsinki, Finland, which was a human rights accords, which in exchange for the Western U.S. and the Western powers, kind of recognizing the borders that had existed in Eastern Europe since the end of World War II, which the Soviet Union very much wanted rep recognized, such as Eastern Ger East Germany existing as a separate nation. In exchange for that, these Eastern European nations in the Soviet Union pledged themselves to do more to recognize human rights within their borders. And this is a very important moment of agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union on this action. Another important thing that happens during this period is that the U.S. and the Soviet Union launch a joint space mission, the Apollo-Soyuz mission, where Apollo spacecraft and a Soyuz spacecraft dock in space, and it's a moment of, of sort of political and international scientific recognition uh, that these two nations perhaps could work, get along after all, that they didn't necessarily have to destroy each, each other through nuclear, um, nuclear force, um, if need be. So with these in both political, economic challenges and kind of foreign challenges, but also opportunities, in the 70s also we begin to see environmental and technological challenges. Um, the post-World War II era had been an era in almost unlimited faith in science and technology. People felt that science and technology were making the world a better place. The atomic bomb, which of course had been very destructive, was also sort of seen as this amazing American product that America had this scientific know-how to create nuclear weapons and you know wasn't that great, weren't we a powerful uh, you know, nation as a result of this, as many Americans thought. But at the same time, in general, a sense of that technology was going to make the world and science would make the world a perfect, or at least a much better place than it had been. Um, and ultimately, this sort of almost unlimited faith in science, if science and technology does something, it must be right, starts to come into question in the 70s. Because what began to happen is we see a number of environmental impacts of the science and technology of the post-World War II era. Air pollution becomes a major source of concern during this period. Water pollution becomes a major source of concern. Uh, Rachel Carson, pictured here on the left, was a scientist who studied the environment and begins to note in 1962, in 1962, a little bit before the 70s, but this continues into the 70s, notes that the product DDT, which was a pesticide that was very effective at killing insects and helping American farmers uh, grow more crops, was also killing bird populations. It was getting into the egg birds and then the sh egg shells were becoming very fragile and then it was not allowing um, the young chicks to hatch. So Carson in Silent Spring ultimately argues that if the U.S. didn't, if, if internationally these um, essentially pollutants weren't dealt with, um, that ultimately it would destroy the environment. And so it really helps bring about kind of the beginnings of the modern environmental movement. This continues during the 70s. There are a number of crises here. The Three Mile Island nuclear reactor in Pennsylvania pictured. There's a partial meltdown in one of its reactor units, which is sort of in many ways um, quite uh, a shock to many Americans, many people worldwide, because nuclear power had been championed as, as this, this safe, this effective source of power that was going to ultimately be the future of energy in the United States. And suddenly it's seen as a, as a threat, as a potential health hazard for American population. Um, so people begin to start questioning science and technology. They begin to start questioning whether, in fact, 
science was bringing about good things or technology was bringing about good things. And we started to see a growing emphasis in the 70s on environmentalism, on pushing for defense of natural, nat natural resources. Um, we tend to see air bills passed to regulate air pollution, to regulate water pollution, to promote wild and scenic rivers, to, uh, to do more to reverse the problems of environmental pollution that had been caused by this new technology uh, of the post-war era. An increasing emphasis on, on, on sort of a new do-it-yourself ethic of getting off the grid, as some people put in the whole Earth catalog here, being sort of a catalog for people to do things themselves, as it says, access to tools, to do it yourself. And so this whole idea of sort of people stopping, not depending so much on big businesses anymore, not depending so much on the grid, quote unquote, but doing it more themselves, being more independent, you know, not being part of the problem, being part of the solution in terms of environmental issues. So all this is a really big shift in kind of America's way of thinking during the 60s and certainly the decade of the 70s. There are also a few social shifts I want to just briefly touch on here at the end of this lecture in that, in a sense, the revolution, the social revolution of the 1960s, the student revolution, the political revolutions of the 60s, the rights revolutions as we called them in, in a previous lecture, continue into the 1970s. The new rights, the right to privacy becomes a big focus of kind of, of discussion, of legal discussion during the 70s, right to birth control, right to abortion access, all these become important uh, political and kind of social conversations during the decade of the 70s. And increasingly, many, many groups assert that they have rights. Uh, the gay and lesbian community, transgender community asserts more rights. Again, Native American communities assert more rights. Other groups, um, uh, Hispanic Latino groups. And so increasingly, there was this sense of what becomes called identity politics. That if you weren't part of that group, you really just couldn't understand it. And this actually in some ways makes it harder for big pieces of legislation to be accomplished because it makes it harder for groups, lots of smaller groups to come together and pass big legislation. So this in a way affects Congress and affects politics in the United States as well. Um, so ultimately you have all these important shifts in social scenes that take place during the 60s and that create during the 70s um, a decade where Americans were beginning to sort of reevaluate socially and culturally how they really fit into the broader society, questioning, you know, whether things like premarital sex were wrong, whether things like birth control were wrong, whether going to psychologists and getting therapy was a bad thing or a good thing. And many people start to question these sort of these older cultural notions and change their minds and ultimately generates what becomes known in later years as a me generation that you have a generation of young people, some of whom had been grown up, had uh, come of age in the 60s, some of whom came of age in the 70s, who become more and more focused on kind of themselves, on, you know, making sure, me first, on making sure that they were taken care of before other things. And so it's sort of an a important cultural shift in the United States that's part of these broader kind of economic, political, social crises, and also, of course, continues to influence the United States well into the 1980s and 1990s. So in summation, uh, the 70s, while well, it's a decade of crisis, as I've already had talked about, um, certainly there are some important um, positive social changes that come out of it. The environmental movement, certainly, um, this sort of reevaluation of cultural and social norms um, that I've just talked about a moment ago. And ultimately, that these, all these forces have a strong influence beyond the 1970s and the decades of the 1980s and the decades of the 1990s and certainly even to this present day.